Hi friends, I'm Jess and welcome to the Hex Library where I post reading, writing, book, and planner related content a couple of times a week. Today is going to be Battle of the Booktubers week one. If you are unaware, there has been this thing going on for the past few months. It has been put together by our overlord Danny at Danny Dabbles, and she has put together four groups of four booktubers each, where we are recommending books to each other, going head to head, having a battle, seeing who is the best book recommender on booktube. Yeah? I will link the playlist down below of all of the booktuber battles, but also the announcement video for round four, which is the round that you're currently watching. In round four, you have myself, Sam at Samantha Donovan, Krista at Books and Jams, and Jolene at Bookworm Adventure Girl. All of those channels, along with Danny's, will be linked down below. The quick, succinct basis of this is that each of the three people that I just mentioned, Sam, Krista, and Jolene, have recommended me four books a piece. I'm reading the top two books of those recommendations. There were four recommended just in case I had already read the first two, but uh, I digress. And I'm gonna read those, I'm gonna rate those, and then there's like a competition, but I don't know who recommended what. So I also have to guess who recommended what. So for week one, we are reading Booktuber D. I just based off of what my recommendations were, and I will tell you what those were. Um, the first recommendation was The City of Brass by S.A. Chakraborty. Two was Trust of the Emerald Sea by Brandon Sanderson. Three was The Haunting of Velkwood by Gwendolyn Keast. And four was Babel by R.F. Kuang. What I will say is that I have decided, if things go according to plan, these videos should be going up on Tuesdays in October. And so you will be seeing these Tuesday, 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 because there's three weeks. And then on the fourth week, theoretically, you should be getting a vlog of me also reading the other two books that the booktuber recommended that were not these books that I'm reading during the video. Though to be fair, will I actually get around to Babel? We don't know. But theoretically, I'm going to attempt to read the other six books in another vlog at the end just for funsies. Booktuber D, I believe, just based off of a wild guess is Sam. That's my best guess. Rolling into this as these books are mostly fantasy. Sam and I are the two fantasy girlies so that would make sense. Jolene and Krista are a bit more broad when it comes to their genres whereas I think Sam and I very much are like over here in fantasy land. I could be completely wrong but that is my best guess. Have I heard of these books? Absolutely. All four of these books are on my TBR. I actually own Babel, I own Haunting of Elkwood. I do not own Trust, but I decided to hold off on buying it till I decided if I liked it or not, because if I like it, I'm gonna buy the pretty edition. And City of Brass I also don't own, but I have had it saved on audiobook like forever. But I have never started it because, you know, your girl is like supposedly trying to read her physical TBR. That's a theory that we're rolling with. But considering we already know that I like high fantasy, I like big like political things where there's lots of battles and things happening. We already know that I like Brandon Sanderson because my top two books of last year were both Brandon Sanderson. We know I like spooky. Like this is a really good list that I feel like I'm going to like everything on. Of the three lists, this is the one that I was most like I could probably like any of these. Of the three lists of books that I got, there was only one that I've never heard of before and maybe one or two that I hadn't really been interested in previously so they just weren't on my TBR. But this list for Booktuber D, everything's on my TBR, everything's a book I'm interested in, half of them I own, so I feel like this is gonna go good. Now what you don't know <laughs> is that I've already started reading Tress of the Emerald Sea. I'm currently at like 47%. I have mentioned before, and this will be the first time you'll be hearing about it because I've filmed another video already. It's gonna be, the clips are gonna be wild, okay? They're gonna be sporadic throughout this, but basically what I'm saying is I had shingles for a large part of the month of August 
and that is when this kind of started being filmed and so a lot of what I've been reading hasn't been getting vlogged because I've just been like lying in my bed trying not to die just from pain and so I've listened to a lot of these like on audiobooks just to get everything done in time for uh, to meet the deadline of the 1st of October. So a lot of these there's not going to be a whole lot of updates but I'm not great at vlogging anyway so we're not surprised by that. But yeah so I've started Trust which is book number two. I will be also reading I will be also be reading I will be reading book the first recommendation after this. Why am I doing two and then one? I don't know. I think I'm scared of City of Brass right now because with the shingles, it really messed with my brain and has been causing me like some, um, <laughs> as I'm sitting here trying to think up of words, it's been causing me some brain thought issue, brain thought process issues, obviously. My brain is not at full capacity and I feel like reading a Sanderson, like, for the most part, I knew Trust was more funsies than some of his other works. So I was like, I feel like I'm more comfortable reading that first than jumping straight into City of Brass, which I feel like is going to be more where I'm going to have to use my brain, basically. Um, so that's why we're reading Trust first instead of reading City of Brass first. So let's talk about Tress. If you are unaware, Tress of the Emerald Sea is one of the four books during the year of Sanderson where Brandon Sanderson was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write 53 books this year and then I'm going to do a Kickstarter program on the internet and then I'm going to publish all of these books and be awesome, which he did. I've read two of the four books so far. One was my second favorite book of last year. One was just okay. I've been waiting to read Tress until I, you know, was like more into it. And the fourth one is following a character from the Stormlight Archives, which is a series I haven't got to yet. So I'm, it's going to sit in the back burner of the world until I get to that series. I'm currently reading through all of the Sanderson series. So we're just, we're just here. Okay. Tress of the Emerald Sea follows our main character, Tress. She has a different name. I can't remember what it is, her actual name, but it's like her grandmother's name and it's very old lady-ish. And she's like, everyone just calls me Tress because I have awesome hair. And she lives on this island in this world where the Emerald Sea is not water. The sea is actually made of spores, which if they touch water, they basically explode into like these giant vines. And in the world that they live in, there's 12 seas and all 12 seas have different spores, um, different colors, different types of spores that all do different things. And so in this world where she lives, if you touch a spore and it gets in your mouth and touches saliva or in your ears, your eyes, your nose, whatever, and it touches sweat or anything liquid on your body, it basically will like expand blowed your body because the root system thing grows out of your face and everything and it's fucking creepy but basically she's not allowed to leave this island however comma she falls in love with a boy as one is known to do and he is a not necessarily a royal but he is like a high society guy even though he is very much not behaving like a high society guy him and his father go on a tour to like find somebody to marry him off to and on the adventure, he ends up being kidnapped by a witch and there's like a ransom for him to be returned, but no one really cares except for Tress. And so Tress decides she's going to find a way to leave the island, which is illegal. They're not supposed to leave the island um, unless you're apparently royalty. There's some questions I have about that. But that's neither here nor there. It will be there when we start talking about it. But when we're talking about the synopsis, it's not here or there. It's going to be there later, but not here. Again, <laughs> my brain thought process is not great. Anywho, she decides to escape the island and go rescue Charlie, her love interest. Okay. If you have read from Brandon Sanderson before and you are aware of the character Hoyd, this book is told from his point of view. So Hoyt is a world hopper. He is a character that exists in most of the Cosmere as different characters throughout. He doesn't necessarily always have his name. He doesn't necessarily always exist as a humanoid shape. He does exist in a lot of different places in a lot of different time periods. I'm not 100% sure what he is because I have only seen instances of him a couple of times because I haven't read 
a lot of the Cosmere yet. We did get a lot of his voice in You Mean the Nightmare Painter and then this whole book is basically just his voice because he's telling the story. If you don't like Hoyt's voice you're not going to like this book. It is very like fourth wall breaky. You get into like him going off on these tangents about different things. I, what I do love about Hoyt is like him as he's telling the story and this does happen quite a few times so far in Tress where he'll be talking about a decision that Tress makes and he'll say if only other heroes would take a moment to do this and you know it's Sanderson's voice really. It's Sanderson saying you know normally when a book like this is written it's you know this XYZ thing happens but if these characters would just be written in a way that they did this instead or if they you know took this moment to do this thing then the whole book would be different. And so Hoyt has that perception of telling you that like, you know, Tress is braver than the rest because she does this thing that no one else really would do in this situation. So again, if you don't like Hoyt's voice, this is not going to be your vibe. I am torn on that aspect of it because sometimes I'm like 100% here for Hoyt and sometimes as I'm reading through this I'm like this is not really holding my attention. So that's kind of where I'm at. I'm at, like I said, 47%-ish. I am having a good time. We've gotten to meet uh, Tress as she has went, escaped the island, and learned about like how she was able to do so because she had to basically use her father to call in every favor that he has ever um, done for people on the island. They talk about how her father is not a rich man, but he is a man of much wealth in that he doesn't have much money but he is the kind of person who without being asked without question without repayment would help his friends and his neighbors do anything that he could help them do you know if your roof needed redone on a Saturday because it was going to monsoon the next day he's the guy that would be there that would do that for you um, you know he would help people do things and so he's spent all of these years building up this goodwill with his community and to get Tress off of the island he finally calls in all of his favors and the community comes together to really help her get off of the island so that she can go and save this man that she loves. So this is where things get a little weird for me as far as like people getting off of the island because it talks about how no one is allowed to leave the island but there are ships that go across the seas which that's a whole other thing where basically the spores are the sea like they are the things that move. There's like currents under it, air currents that make the spores move and that's what makes the ships move. And I don't know how any of that works but I, I'm not a physicist. So that's not my job to figure that out. I'm just here to like go okay sure I guess that makes sense. But what doesn't make sense is the we're told that people aren't supposed to leave the island and that people aren't really supposed to go anywhere because they don't want to risk the spread of those spores to other places. But then there's entire ships of people who do trading from island to island and those people there's no real regulation about who's on those ships other than they can't like take the townspeople onto the ships but you could be a sailor and go from ship to ship at any point at any time and they have pirates who are people who are outside of the law who are pirating boats through the spore seas and so like I don't know how the regulation is made that like like how do you know who's a pirate, who's a sailor, who's allowed to go onto the boat, who's not allowed to go on the boat. Like it feels like very questionable in that aspect. Like that part of it really did not work for my brain and maybe it was explained somewhere and I just missed it but that part really just did not work for me. What I will say is working is the characters. Um, again Hoyt I love that like <laughs> There's so many people on the ship and he talks about it being like a 60 man ship even though it's men and women. A 60 crew ship and basically he's told you like the names of like six to ten characters and he's like these characters are the important ones and everyone else we're gonna call Doug. It doesn't matter man, woman, whatever their job is their name is Doug. If you hear me say Doug I'm just talking about this random person that it doesn't matter who they are. And then he goes off on this spiel about how every species that he's met, every world that he's been on, there's always like someone named Doug. It's lots of lots of people named Doug. It's a really popular name and when it becomes super popular that's about when the world is about to end. That world is going to end because they've gotten a surplus of Dougs. And so he's just like Doug is the one thing that translates into every language. And it's just like 
it's just this tangent that while funny doesn't really need to be there and kind of takes away from the story in my opinion but I, again it's like you have to you have to want Hoyt's voice to be part of the story because if you're wanting it to be simply about Tress and her journey then it's not going to work for you and I do wish we were getting more of her journey but also we're getting Hoyt both as a, a narrator and as a character because he also exists as a character in the book and you want to talk about somebody out of his mind and we learn like why he's not in his right mind and we're starting to learn like why he's there and how he got there and then there's other things going on there's a lot of stuff happening and I'm not really sure how any of it fits together there's a lot of logistics that I'm not sure how the logistics are logisticking. I just don't necessarily understand everything, but I'm not supposed to understand everything at this point. Like if we get to, you know, the end of the book and I still don't understand those things, then that's going to be different. But at this point in the game, other than some of the like questionable world things about why we are having spore seas, where does the water in the atmosphere come from? If not, and how do we get water? I have a lot of scientific logistic questions that I guess I... And probably never going to get an answer to and I have to be okay with that but it's an adventure story and am I having a good time on the adventure story so far yes not the most fun I've ever had but I'm having fun anywho that was 20 minutes of me rambling about Tress and I have another half of the book to go will I update you before I'm finished probs not you'll probably get an update at the end because that's how I roll so I'll see you then. Okay, so I immediately, I'm currently at 80% of trust. Immediately after I started listening this morning from when I last updated you yesterday, uh, we got to the environmental aspects and figuring out how rain played into the book. As a matter of fact, there was, rain was brought up and then Hoyt, our narrator, said, I hadn't talked about rain up to this point. And some of you, if you were ecologically minded, probably were going, what about the rain, Hoyt? And in fact, I were. So we did get that immediately following. However, the last 30% of this book has been an absolute bore. Like, guys, I am, it's fine. It's a book it exists. There's some parts that are fantastic that like there's certain lines, certain things like we discussed in the last, you know, the last update. There are some parts that are very well done or, you know, really funny or um, very clever or I just, you know, liking the um, style of, of Hoyt's voice and, and how he's, you know, telling these stories. And so there's a lot of that going on, but <laughs> the story overall is just not working for me for some reason which you would think I like adventures I like ship battles I don't mind traveling books especially when we stay with one core group of people um, we're learning about the characters I don't necessarily dislike any of them but I also don't really care about any of them I can't remember any of these people's names the helmsmaster the carpenter and I don't remember what his job is, but the gentleman who is deaf and uses a board to communicate. I think he's a cook. Not a good one, but I think that's what he is. <laughs> they are more interesting to me than Tress. Tress is like a wet blanket. And not in the sense that she does have these characteristics that, you know, as the, we're being told through the narrator, like characteristics that are not common within um, different heroic stories. But I, for some reason, it's like having the narrator tell you, like, in that moment, the old dress was gone and she was now the new dress. And just something about that just isn't working for me. So it's like, on one hand, the narrator's voice works for me in the sense that I like the breaking of the fourth wall in some parts and some of, like, the things that have been put into the story. But also it takes away from the story because I feel like I'm being force-fed things that I don't need to be force-fed because I've read a book before and I know how plots work. So um, I'm very confused as to how I feel about this story. This is definitely, I mean, there some crazy things would have to happen at this point and like I don't think it's a spoiler to say that there's a dragon in this book and I have met the dragon and I gave no fucks like normally if there's a dragon in the book you're like you fuck yeah a dragon and I mean the dragon was cool and I liked like the description of dragons and how they exist in the Cosmere 
you know, the backstory that we're getting from our narrator, but also, ugh, like, something amazing would have to happen in this last 20% for me to love this book. Um, something amazing would have to happen in the last 20% for this to not be my least favorite Sanderson that I've ever read. Maybe what we're learning here is that just because you can write six books during a pandemic, maybe you shouldn't. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, maybe, maybe don't tell Sanderson because I don't want him coming at me because I respect him in many ways. He's written some of my favorite books. He's a genuinely seemingly nice dude. But maybe just because you can do a thing doesn't mean you should. I'm just saying, maybe, maybe. But I'm probably not gonna finish that until tomorrow um, because I'm not gonna read any more of it tonight. What am I gonna read for the rest of the night? So many things I need to read and no care to read them so wish me luck okay it is time for us to discuss stress of the emerald sea i ended up at a three star a 3.25 could be debatable but um i think we're only doing half ratings for <laughs> this uh, challenge and not doing quarter star ratings which is what i normally do but we're gonna go with a three i was absolutely wrong it is a lower rating than what i gave frugal wizard and I'm not sure if it's because I didn't expect anything from Frugal Wizard, whereas Tress, I expected to really enjoy it, and I just didn't. I don't know. I'm like, maybe it's the right book at the wrong time or the wrong book at the right. I don't know what the problem is with this book, but it just didn't. It was fine. Like, it was, it was fine. I could have DNF'd this at any point and been okay with it. The last 20% did not save it for me. I don't, I don't know, it, it was kind of like we were being told that Tress was supposed to be this, the hero of her own story and she was supposed to save herself. Like it was supposed to be this, but she didn't though. Like, did she save herself against the dragon? Maybe. I mean, that could be argued, but against the witch? Not really. I mean, would she be, have? would they all have been in that position had she not kind of push for them to be there? No. But she didn't save herself. She didn't really save anyone. I think she was saved by others, men in particular. So like at the end of the day, was the whole book just her having to suffer so that two men could be saved? And isn't that a thing that we're trying not to do? I just, it was sloggy. It was slumpy. It was lumpy in the middle, especially. The characters were fine. Like that's that's it. the thing though. Is like every, everything was fine. It was fine. Like there was nothing inherently wrong, but there was also nothing that I was excited for or looking forward to. Or there were some good ideas, and like we've discussed, um, some of the getting Hoyt's voice, his point of view, um, the whole story be from his point of view, which Sanderson talks about at the end of the book um, in his author's note, where he talks about how he a lot of this book was put together from multiple ideas of other things. The type of seas that they have, the spore seas, was from one idea that he's had in the past. Tress's plot storyline was kind of an idea that he's had that's been sitting around. He had an idea to write a book from Hoyt's point of view at some point in the future, and so this was his way of like trying it out by using him to write someone else's story. So, and I just, maybe those things didn't work together as seamlessly as I would have liked. But on paper, which is a weird way to say it because it is literally on paper, <laughs> but the colloquialism of on paper, this was definitely a book that I should have enjoyed. There's no aspects of it that when you list out what the book includes, would you be like, mm, that doesn't seem like something you would like. But for some reason, it just was fine. And that's meh. You know, like, the thing is, like, it's not a bad book. It's not awful. It's not, it's not bad. It just, I have nothing to say other than it's fine. And that in itself is sad. We're just going to leave that at that and move forward to 
City of Brass by S.A. Chalker Bordy. I started this last night because I actually ended up staying up all night and not all night. I ended up staying up last night and finishing Tress because I was like, girl, you're not having a good time. Just read it. Just get it over with. Just finish it because I can't. I don't want to anymore. Just finish it. And then this morning I started City of Brass, which again has been, it was my top pick from booktuber d so this is the one that gets like a higher multiplier for points which is probably a good thing because so far at seven percent i'm enjoying it much better than i was enjoying tress at this point but i've had city of brass on my hoopla favorites list since before i think the third book came out like it's been there for a long time but i've never physically owned it so it's never been a priority and typically what i have like the books i have saved on my hoopla favorites is like things that i'm interested in and i'll be like it'll fit for a, a prompt for a, a readathon or something but it's a 20 hour book so i never pick it up for a readathon but now's the time if for some reason you don't know city of brass is set I believe in Egypt it's definitely in the Middle East area. Let me mute the besties chat because they are being loud over here. Nari is someone who doesn't believe in magic but also kind of possesses magic. She has the ability to tell when someone is sick and also what their illness is and she's also good at actually healing people. She can also heal herself if she is injured. Her body does it of its own accord. Um, she's never met anyone who has that skill, but it is a skill that she has. I don't believe that she knows who her parents are. I believe she's an orphan. She has the ability to speak multiple languages that she never really learned. Just once she hears them, she has the ability to pick them up and to be able to speak them fairly fluently. And there's also a language that she says is her native language, but she's never heard anyone else ever speak it. She knows it inside and out in her brain and she can say it out loud and she like recognizes what the words translate to in other, other languages, but she's never found another person who can speak that language. And the story starts out with her um, showing, uh, basically the book showing us that she's a con woman. Um, she cons rich people out of their money, convinces them to like leave their house for seven days to like repent or like let their air, their house air out and get the disease out of it. And she like, while they're gone, goes to their house and robs them. She's friends with a Jewish man who owns an apothecary in the same part of Cairo that she's in. Um, his name is Jakob and um, he definitely like tries to take care of her and like make sure that she's not being too crazy um, but she specifically like tells people that they need herbs that he has and then like they split the profits from them because she's convincing people that they need his things. She goes to heal this um, like preteen age girl who her family thinks she is uh, possessed by a demon and Nari has kind of learned over the years like what kind of things you should say like the religious people say in order to um, make it seem like you're doing something even though she doesn't believe that that is that that magic is real uh, mostly she does it because there's food there and she is poor so she needs the food and uh, she goes to do this like demon whatever cleansing for this family and while she's there she ends up um, doing some of the ritual in her native tongue and things kind of go a little bit weird from there and she accidentally summons a jinn which she does not believe exists prior to that. I don't know what else happens in the story that's about as far as I've got at seven percent. Um, there's something inside the young girl, demon or otherwise, I don't know. Um, we've just discovered that the person that she summoned accidentally is a jinn and we know that whoever the thing is that's inside the girl they are able to wake the dead and turn them into ghouls and they are attacking nari and the jinn that's all i know i'm assuming that the city of brass is a place and probably where she comes from where they speak the language that she knows i could be wrong but so far i'm really enjoying this i again i'm not very far in tomorrow is friday so i'll be in the office by myself i definitely won't finish this tomorrow because it is a long one but i should get pretty far into it tomorrow if i mean it's possible i could finish it tomorrow but i highly doubt it um, but i should be at least 50 percent tomorrow so we'll do an update for that then i think that's all i have to update you on tonight I'll see you guys to update wherever I'm at at the end of the, the work day tomorrow. Okay, friends, I am not currently at home. I'm currently house sitting, so excuse the lighting and the, all of the things that are not normal 
Um, I am currently at 48% of City of Brass. It is one, two, three, four, five days later than what I had expected to be at whilst updating you on this book. So that should give you an idea of how it's going. Uh, so here's my issues with this book and I'm gonna start with issues and then I'll talk about some things that I am enjoying. I feel like, as discussed previously, I should know more than I know right now. I'm at 48% and I am still so confused about the Jin and the Deva. Like I know that they are technically the same thing um, because Dara talks about how it's just like a per the Jin is a perversion of Deva, like the term is a perversion of the term. But he at no point or at any point does anyone explain the difference because in Devabad, the Deva often go by Jin. And he even says at one point, like once they very first get to Devabad, because that's where we're at at 48%, they've just gotten to Devabad. She asks if someone is a Deva and he said, they would probably prefer that you call them Jin. And she's like, okay, cool. And I'm like, okay, cool, but why? Like, what is, at no point has anyone explained to me why one part of them refers to be prefers to be called Jin while one prefers to be called Deva and if they have explained it I've missed it <laughs> okay I just there is so much that I do not understand the entire Devabod like the the city no fucking clue what's going on to me so when we are in Nari's point of view I'm having a great time uh other than the weird romancy stuff between her and a dude who's like 1600 years old because like she's 18 assuming she's 18 I don't think I can't remember if we've been told how old she is or not I know Ali is 18 and so she's somewhere between 16 and 18 because that's YA and that makes sense if she was 18 and you were telling me that he looks like he's in his 30s so you're like he's 35 she's 18 I'm gonna be like fuck no like that is not acceptable but for some reason because he's 1600 I'm supposed to be okay with that aspect of it and I'm decidedly not okay with that. Is that just, that's just a whole genre thing, right? Like whenever the girl is the main character, she's always in a YA and sometimes even in new adult, she's usually between the ages of 16 and 21. And for some reason, the guy is in excess of 400 years old and we're just okay with it. And sometimes I'm having so much fun, I don't care. You know what I mean? Like when I'm reading a book and it's a fun time and I'm just here for the vibes and I'm like, who cares that he's a thousand years older than her? We're having fun, you know? But when I'm in it and I'm like trying to figure out what the fuck is happening in the book because I'm not having a fun time, it makes me angry. I'm like decidedly angry. I'm like, why is he so much older than her? And why is it, and, and just why, okay? Anywho, that's another thing. But when we're in Nari's point of view, it, most of it is travel. Most of it is her having to run from the Ifrits and him basically every opportunity to info dump as possible. Like to the point that like their lives are at stake and she's like, info dump me now, bitch, or I'm gonna shoot you in the head. And he's like, cool. And then he gives her a three hour info dump spiel. And I, want to do that too but I want to do that in Devabod. I want to hold a gun to someone's head and be like info dump me now bitch or I'm gonna shoot you in the head so that someone will tell me what the fuck is happening in Devabod because I have no clue. I'm supposed to, this is what I understand. Now, if you've read this book before you tell me if I'm right or wrong. I believe what I'm supposed to believe is that this city is comprised mostly of Deva or Jin. Don't know which one they prefer to be called because I fucking couldn't tell you but most of them are Deva and some of them are um, Shafit, which are the mixed blood Deva and human, if my memory serves me correctly. I think the king said at one point there was like one third of the population is Shafit. But the Shafit are poor. They're not allowed to leave. They're not allowed to hold jobs. They can't have weapons. What the fuck are they to do? Like you can't, have a job they're allowed to be servants or sex slaves basically they never say it that way like they're very like 
oh my god I almost said demure in like a very unironic way and that makes me want to vomit right now ew they say it in a very like non-sexual way to say that they're a sex slave you know and it's like n no you're selling them into sex slavery and somehow that's okay but how do they afford to feed people oh they can't so they're like the Deva are mad at them because they exist, which the Shafi didn't choose to exist. Their parents decided to bone a human and now they're here. The Deva don't want them to exist, but they also are not allowed to punish them for, ex not allowed to punish them for existing. Um, they're not allowed to let them go into the human world because they could cause more problems. So they're supposed to just deal with them, but they're not dealing with them. They're just there. And somehow the religion plays into this too. And I'm not 100% sure how that has one has anything to do with the other because Suleiman apparently didn't want the Shafi to exist but also didn't because he thought that the Deva should stay separate from the humans put in those kinds of rules and he tried to put the Deva under his command but then the Shafi do exist like it doesn't make any sense to me what they're doing why would you have a people in your town and I mean, I know that this is the point. The The point of these things is so that they get better. They're, sh they're showing like a, a bad part of society. Uh, this is also a little bit of a history lesson. If you don't know, the author, S.A. Chakraborty, is Muslim. So it does, that does ha play a large religion aspect into it. If you are reading it and you've, you hear Suleiman and you're not sure who that's supposed to be, that is uh, King Solomon in like the Christian Jewish Bible. So like there's some religion aspect like the religion in real life is is meshed into that and these are like the Deva and the Shafi and the Ifrit they are actual Muslim stories. So that is also playing a part into it. And so I don't know if like my the part of my brain that knows history from this time period is also trying to figure it out and trying to like help me make sense of things because I know a lot about religion generally. And so I'm like trying to assign people to things and things to people and things that I know that have happened in history and to, to help me try to make sense of it because I have no clue what's fucking happening and I and and I'm still just like I don't I don't get it I don't know why the king is from a different place and don't get me started on what the difference is between these different people because there's like six or nine different versions of Deva but they all have like different creatures and like humans are created from the earth but there's these big bird things that are created from air and Dara is from his name is Dara D-A-R-A but it sounds like she's saying Dada all the time especially when you're listening to the audiobook and it is as someone who gets the ick from a daddy kink having her <laughs> call her love interest Dara all the time makes me want to vomit okay anywho having Dara be this like bajillion year old guy who is part of this sect of people that came from fire but he's like the only one who's left alive and they all think he's dead but he's not because no one's seen him for 1400 years where the fuck has he been and something about Nari pulled him from the ether I don't know how that happened and I'm assuming that at some point in the back half of this book somebody's gonna explain something to me maybe probs not and then we have Ali and I like Ali Zad I don't dislike the characters okay I like Ali Zad I like Donna I like Nari I think they are interesting characters in the aspect of like you have Nari who is like this <laughs> basically a criminal we like her we have Ali who though I'm not 100% sure what it is that he's doing because I don't understand again as we have discussed I don't understand the function of this city where these his dad like overthrew the people who were there before but was it the not was it the oh my god I can't even remember what the name of them are the healer people whatever their names are I can't it was an N name but I don't remember what the name is anyway the healery people who like had the castle originally and for some reason nobody trusted them and they were all bad and so we killed them all I have no idea why I'm not I haven't even really got apprised upon that <laughs> so was it his family or someone else's family Ollie's family I don't really know do you know because I don't and so his father and him and his brother come from another kingdom 
because there's more of those apparently. And they don't look like anyone else. They're much taller than everyone else and they have different uh, hair color, eye color than everyone else. So they're here and they're running things. They just came in and took over and they're running shit, which to me is, I know happened in antiquity, but it's a choice, okay? Um, also, Gillian is playing with his toy and you're hearing quickly sounds in the background and you're gonna live with that while I try to figure out what the fuck is happening in this book. You have Ali, like, he doesn't agree with the way his father runs the country, the cap, the city. He doesn't agree with the way his father runs Davabob. So he's like trying to do things behind the scenes, but then isn't sure that what he's doing is actually right because everything that he thought that he knew is wrong, but also is it, but also why do you not agree with the things that you, like, what? They all have the same God. And this is gonna be a whole other thing for a whole other nickel. They all have the same God, but why do they not believe the same thing of the same God? And I know that that is a thing that happens in real life. I get it, I understand the concept. I know that the point of this book is to really, t as like a reflection of religion and the way that things happened in the past and how that reflects upon the future. And I get that aspect, but I just want something in this book to make sense. I am praying for something in this book to make sense. And I am at a loss. I, I don't, understand what's happening. I don't get it. Um, they talk about how the deva are not as fertile as the Shafi and so if there's a particularly powerful Shafi child um, the deva will steal the child and have them raised by uh, a deva family which is awful that they're taken from their family but also look at the aspect of as a Shafi they wouldn't be able to have a damn thing because they are not allowed to have jobs or decide who to marry or have families with or do anything. So they're basically just cockroaches upon the earth. And so, I mean, I don't know if I was a Shafi and I had a child who had lots of powers, I'd probably be happy that a Deva wanted to raise them because as a parent, if you are a selfless person, you would want your child to be raised in a society where they are uh, able to have a job and a career and a life and be fed and not have to worry about dying from sickness because also did I mention that it's illegal for anyone to give health care to Shafit. They're not allowed to be healed. Um, they can't have medicine. They're not allowed to ha you're not allowed to give them help, medical help in any way, shape or form. That's another issue for a whole other nickel. But yeah, it's like a selfless parent. Like you love your child and you want to raise your child and be with them because you love them. But also I would think that you would be okay with, on to some extent, you would think that the Shafi would be like, well, you know, we live in this two by two foot room with 16 other families and we don't have enough money to feed ourselves or squeak toy. We don't have enough money to feed ourselves. We can't, we don't have jobs. We're not allowed to do anything. We're just laying here in this hovel. Oh, my kid has power. What family can I give them to so that they will raise them and feed them and they'll have like a productive life. Like, <laughs> I mean, we're supposed to be mad about it, but I'm not really that mad about it, which is says a lot about me, I guess. I have been filming this update for 20 minutes. And when I tell you that I still am just like, what? What was happening in this book? Uh, the fact that I'm at 48% and I don't know anything that's happening in Davabod, I, I mean, I, like plot wise, like I know what's happening in the moment. Like I know people are dying and there's some bad things happening and there's probably a war coming. I get all of that, but I don't understand any of the backstory, which is dumb because I've been consistently throughout the entire book info dumped too. And I feel like if I'm gonna have to live through this many info dumps, I should have more info. I should know what's going on. That being said, cause I did say I was gonna mention some good things. I do like, as I said, the characters, I like Nari and Dada and Ali. Um, I like Ali's brother. Will he continue to be a good character? Will he be a villain? I don't know, but I do like him as of right now. I like the big wing bird man. He's cool. Like there are characters that I like. I don't even dislike Ali's father. I don't, which is questionable because he's a king and he has some weird theories, but like as a character, I think he so far is like a well-built character. And I don't dislike the plot as far as like having them try to get to Devabod, um, her being someone who is, you know, important to this history and, and Dara being someone who is taking her there, even though he knows that he'll probably be captured and put in prison. 
Um, he's taking their, her there anyway. And we don't know what happened in the past. So we don't know why. We just know that he's the scourge of something. I don't know. He's this evil villain somehow, some way, somewhere at this thing that happened 1400 years ago. Couldn't fucking tell you what. And then, you know, knowing what's going on in the city, knowing that the city kind of is at this unrest and there's going to be this breaking point between the Deva and the Shafit. And probably it, Ali's going to have to decide which side of that battle he's going to be on um, and how um, Dara and Nari are going to play into that. Like, I like that, like the plot aspects of that. I just wish I understood the setup. Like, I wish I understood who these people are and why they are who they are and why they are the way they are. And I just don't, I don't get it. I don't understand any of it. And again, maybe it's just me. Maybe I missed a chapter. I didn't miss a chapter, but benefit of the doubt, maybe I missed a chapter. It's been a very questionable time, basically. Today is Tuesday and I had expected to be at the 50% mark on Friday. So I'm really struggling with this one and it's putting me off. Would I have DNF'd this at this point? If this was a less loved series, if I didn't know so many people who have given this series, especially this first book, five stars, I would have DNF'd this at 15%, maybe 20, just from lack of understanding from lack of having anything going into my brain and staying in there. Like it just does not compute. And to me that typically just means that even if it's a good story, my brain doesn't understand the delivery system and it probably never will no matter what the story does. And so I probably had this not been as loved of a series as it is, I probably would have DNF'd a while ago. Because I know so many people love it, I hope that there's something in this back half that is going to make me happy that I didn't DNF it at any point. I just, I have so many questions, so few answers. That's, that's where I'm at. I will give you guys an update either at 75% or at the end, depending on how quickly I read the rest of this book. Okay, we are here for my final update for the City of Brass. <laughs> Things happened. So as I said, I was not enjoying this book and I honestly was considering DNFing it. It was a time I had to make some decisions. And so what I ended up doing was I basically skim read the last half of the book. I was like, oh God, I just really don't think, I don't think I'm going to enjoy it. And so I did end up skim reading it and I went through deciding what I wanted to do for rating wise. Um, I double checked with Danny and made sure that if, you know if we are DNFing a book that does mean that it gets zero points. How Merlin listen I'm trying to talk to our friends. I can't hold you right now so I'm gonna need you to get down. Okay she's so chonky. So I talked to Danny I made sure that like the rules were if we DNF a book we give it zero points. I was like which I agree with because typically if I DNF a book I don't read it and I was like okay so this is the clarification process for this. Um, I checked with the boss and what I typically do is if I read 60% or more of a book and I skim read any part of it whether it's the soggy middle or the end or whatever the case may be I feel like I have a good enough grasp of the story to fully rate it and I will rate it and then I take off a solid point for having skim read parts of it. So I read up to the 75% mark of City of Brass and then skim read the end of it. Ended up at a three star, which means it ends up with a two star. City of Brass is a two star book for me. I don't understand <laughs> what about it doesn't work. I mean, I do understand what doesn't work for me. I mean, we've talked at length. The majority of this video is me trying to figure out what the fuck is going on with City of Brass because I don't understand what the other people are seeing in this book and I I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't understand how anybody knows what's going on because I have no fucking clue. And just the idea, the idea of this romance between an 18 year old girl and a 1600 year old genie is absurd. And listen, we complain, we complain about, it's, it's the twilight of it all. We complain about Bella being 16 and Edward being 160. But for some reason, when they're 18 and 1600, he's 10 times as old as Edward and that's supposed to be okay. I, <laughs> clearly I have feelings. <laughs> and even, I mean, obviously outside of that, the romance is not the central part of this book. It's very minuscule. I just, uh, reading through reviews and seeing like people talk about you know the book itself and everyone's like really about the romance and I'm just like girl what were you reading? <laughs> I do like the characters though I do think that the characters were okay they were fine 
but just the plot and the story and the I it was so I have no clue what's happening and I still don't know and I still don't care. I obviously will not be continuing on with the series which makes me sad because I really wanted to enjoy it. I do plan to look into um reading more by Chakraborty in the future because I do know that I can't remember what the ship one is. It's a ship. There's a ship on it. I do know that she has continued to write more things and so I will continue to I will pick up something else from her in the future just because I don't like there's nothing problematic about her book it just didn't work for me there's nothing problematic about an 18 year old and a 1600 year old Deva I'm totally fine okay there's nothing inherently problematic about her book outside of that I also know that just as I have read skim read and done other things like I know that there is a love triangle and there's other aspects of relationships moving into the next couple of books and there's other things that happen and it is a more nuanced thing and I know that there are other relationships that are more important and other relationships that are viewed throughout the series um so like I, I did my research I did I did my research I just it's not for me I will check out her work again in the future but this book was just not for me but however let's discuss so I read Tress of the Emerald Sea and City of Brass looking at all of the books that I've been given for <laughs> this Battle of the Booktubers. These are the two books that I thought for sure would be five star books. Like these are the two books that I thought walking into this would be my two favorite books of the entire thing. And that just has not been the case, obviously. Uh, because what Tress ended up at a three. Yeah, Tress was a three. City of Brass is a two. I have questions like about myself. So I do believe that these were my recommendations from Sam. And like Sam, I get it because I also thought that these would be five star books for me. I don't, I don't know what happened. Like I do not know what happened. As I said, Brandon Sanderson is like a, a sure bet for me. Like there's only one book that I have rated up until now, like below a four star. Like my top two favorite books of last year were both Sanderson. A clear bet. Like that is a winning bet to make. Unfortunately, <laughs> it didn't work. And City of Brass definitely has, I mean, I love political intrigue. I love big, like, populations with issues. I love, a, like, a romance that's a questionable romance because I am a Vampire Academy girl and I do love me some Rose and Dimitri and that is very questionable. Like, I, I have problems, okay? And I, I accept that these should have been books that really worked for me and they just really didn't. And I don't know why. I mean, we've discussed why, but I don't know why. Like, I don't know. On paper, these books should have worked for me and been five stars, and they just were not. I expected Tress to be, like, an all-time favorite. I expected City of Brass to be something that I was like, I have to, like, buy all three books and read them right now, and that is just not what happened at all. This was a wild journey for me, for sure. I definitely have questions about my own ability to pick my own five-star reads at this point. Booktuber D, whoever you are, I'm assuming you're Sam. Whoever you are, thank you for giving me these books A because I did need to read them because they have been, like I, get, like I said at the beginning, like saved forever. And and I'm sorry that I didn't enjoy them more because again, these are like solid books choices. This is what I would have picked for me, honestly. <laughs> so I, I, I see the logic and I just don't understand why the logic is not logicking, but here we are. So if you made it this far with the video, leave me a sword emoji because this is a battle. Uh, don't forget to check the links down below to catch all of our other participants in Battle of the Booktuber for this round and also Danny is listed down below as well and any other booktuber that I've mentioned during this video will be linked down below as well. That is all I have for today here in the library. If you don't want to miss anything going on in the future, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell down below. And until then, I will see you guys next time. Bye.